Let's start out with the bare bones of this story. Five black kids have been charged with sexually assaulting, sodomizing four white kids at a high school in Maryland. Nobody knows nothing because they're being charged as juveniles. Nobody knows nothing because not one reporter will say all the people doing the raping were black and all the victims were white. They, they won't even mention the fact that all the victims are the sons of law enforcement officers, cops. So you, now you know. Let's see, let's see how the reporters report this story knowing that they know. Late this afternoon, Montgomery County prosecutors charging three Damascus High School JV football players with rape. And all of this is coming from what is being called a hazing incident. ABC7 Montgomery County reporter Kevin Lewis at Damascus High tonight with the breaking new details for us. Kevin. And Jonathan, a number of current and former Damascus football players tell me hazing has happened before, but nothing to this extent. The alleged rapes taking place on campus after class on Halloween Day. Damascus High School's football program in turmoil after reports of hazing involving a wooden broomstick in the boys' locker room. Sources say the victims were picked in part based on their age and athleticism. Today, police revealed three male students have been charged and four male students identified as victims. The criminal charges include two counts of second-degree rape and two counts of attempted second-degree rape. The criminal case in the hands of the juvenile court system, which means the suspects' names will not be made public. Their future court hearings shielded, too. Even if it was tradition, it shouldn't be tradition at all. You know, sexual assault. Ryan Holt's brother plays on Damascus's varsity team, which recently set a national record for most consecutive high school wins. It is a few members of the team. It's really messed up what happened. But, you know, it shouldn't mess up the score and the reputation. But it does definitely put a dent in it. The JV squad had been undefeated this season, but forfeited its game last night in light of the locker room rape allegations. Today, we stopped by the JV coach's home, but he declined to comment. No one would really expect this to happen here at Damascus because typically everybody's really nice with each other, friendly, and this just has never happened. Now, Damascus High School says its varsity team played no role in these alleged rapes. The varsity squad playing Wooten High School tonight in Rockville. Kickoff set for 6.30. We're live in Damascus. I'm Kevin Lewis, ABC 7 News. And as we come on the air this afternoon, anger after a judge ruled that a fifth suspect in the Damascus rape case will be tried as a juvenile. This teenager accused of being the ringleader of the group involved in that attack. Montgomery County reporter Kevin Lewis live for us in Rockville with reaction to the new developments. Kevin. Michelle Nancy, the judge, went against the advice and request of prosecutors and the Department of Juvenile Services, instead siding with a paid expert witness. His reasoning claims that suspect J.C. Abetti has severe ADHD. The victims um, are outraged. Attorneys speaking on behalf of the four Damascus high school victims claim suspect J.C. Abetti is getting off easy. This young man was six foot one, 240 pounds, um, had no problem laughing as he and his teammates sodomized uh, these young men. Abetti's school record includes 12 suspensions, 61 write-ups, and 141 notices to mom about sexual touching, sexual remarks, fighting, shouting, and cutting class. The defendant uh, suffered from an inability to control his impulses. Defense attorney Dan Whitney hired this clinical psychologist to testify that Abetti has severe ADHD and wasn't properly medicated until now. He couldn't have driven himself to the pediatrician. He couldn't have gone and, and forced the coach to come into the locker room and make sure that things were supervised. The father of one victim told ABC7 following the judge's ruling, I am outraged. My son will be outraged. This attack is something you hear about happening in a federal penitentiary or a prison yard, not in Montgomery County Public Schools. Prosecutors express frustration, too, in part because juvenile court uses kid gloves. It's a reality that th this young man 
or, or anybody that goes through the juvenile system is going to be back into the community, reintegrated, probably in about a year. I love that psychologist at the end there. He said, well, we can't blame the kid for doing all that raping because uh, he wasn't on enough drugs. Please, sir, I want some more. That's the, that's the standard now. That's the standard of black on white hostility, black on white violence, black on white mayhem and dysfunction. So wildly out of proportion, black kids get to walk because we didn't give them enough drugs. We didn't have them expose them to enough crazy psychologists who will just ex excuse the worst possible, worst imaginable behavior. And now we got these cops sending their children to, a, to this school, public school. The kids are being attacked because they're white by black people and nobody wants to even raise an eyebrow or suggest that has, that means, that has any meaning whatsoever. That's how sick this is all getting. That's how much denial, deceit, and delusion we're seeing every day. All because they don't want to make the black kids angry. Back when I was a younger man, I did some work for a hotshot writer in Southern California. And whenever I would come up with a particularly stupid idea, he wouldn't look at me and say I was stupid. He would say, Colin, I admire your innocence. And so when one of our many viewers and readers in St. Louis sent me this recent article from the, the major daily out there about why teachers are quitting in St. Louis classrooms, well, I read the article and I read down and when I was finished, the only thing I could say is I admire their innocence because the only other explanation is we have to condemn their denial, deceit, and delusion. Why don't we just get to the money graph of the latest report? This, re this story goes on and on and on. The teachers are quitting. They're, they can't get teach. They can't even get substitute teachers in St. Louis schools. And it talks about how, you know, the kids are watching TV or just kicking a dodgeball around in, in, in gym class and just a lot of mayhem, a lot of chaos. Why don't we get to the money graph here? One of the school administrators said she could only guess as to why teachers left. Uh, but she suspects pay. They're paid $40,000 a year. By the way, uh, if you're a teacher in an urban, air quotes, district, you get lots of money from the federal government. They give you a, a loan while you're in school. And if you work four years in an underserved district, a black district, you basically get a lot of these loans forgiven. Even that is not enough to keep these teachers in the schools. The re conditions are so ridiculous. And so even the, so the, the school won't admit that. But the reporter basically at least tips her hat to it at some part in the story. Classroom environment, specifically student discipline, may also play a role. Last year was the first year the district halted suspensions for kindergarten and second grade. The policy was intended to uh, keep, keep students in school and learning. But that year, Frenchie, the school, lost all of her K through two teachers. And this woman, this Frenchy administrator says, well, yeah, we got to teach them all this different stuff. They don't, they don't know anything coming out of college. Teachers are coming out of college. They're not coming from a place where they're equipped to deal with some of these social emotional traumas that we experience in urban education. As a result, it tends to create traumatized adults. The white, the new teachers are overwhelmingly white women when they go to teach in black schools, they become traumatized. Hold on to that thought, because we're going to hear it again. I don't know why anybody would say a teacher is traumatized when, if you listen to the ACLU and the Department of Justice under Obama, it was the students who were being traumatized, because all these white teachers were picking on black students and suspending them and expelling them, apparently for no reason whatsoever, all the time while they ignored... Uh, the white students. You know, in the neighboring school district, uh, Normandy School District, That's I think that's the school district of uh, 
St. Michael Brown of Ferguson. They did, you know, the same paper did a story on this just a couple years ago. Same, exact same story. It's like, hey, what happened to all the teachers? Why do the teachers, why do the new teachers quit? Some crazy number of new teachers quit, like in the first couple weeks, like 40%. And so uh, the paper figured it out back then. They didn't have any trouble figuring out what was wrong then. What, and, and, and the answer is, why do so many te- why why is there so much violence in schools? Why is there so much violence against teachers? Why do so many teachers have such poor success with in these black schools? The answer is, quote, many new teachers are white and taught in previously and previously taught in more affluent suburban schools. Some are struggling to connect with their students, most of whom are black and come from impoverished backgrounds. And don't make the black kids angry. We tell stories of one district after another, whether it's Philadelphia or Baltimore or Milwaukee or Memphis, over and over and over and over, the teachers are under attack. They're quitting. They're being traumatized. We've done, anybody who watches this channel for any period of time knows we've done a lot of these stories. But apparently the people who write for the St. Louis paper, they're not really familiar with them. So I thought, why don't we just pluck out a few recent ones, maybe one or two classic ones, and why don't we just run them right now, just as a reminder to everybody, the unbelievable level of violence in black schools directed at white teachers and black teachers. The principal says it started in the cafeteria with a fight among three students, but when a staff member intervened, Someone else took out their phone and matters only escalated. Video recorded on Snapchat shows a staff member breaking up a fight between students. When the altercation turned physical, assistant principal Brian Brennan was violently taken down. Students are shown pulling and hitting Brennan for more than 10 seconds. Another staff member tries to help but also gets caught in the brawl. Look at that. Moments later, a school resource officer struggles to get a hold of the students. County police confirm a 15-year-old and two 16-year-olds were taken into custody. Police say Brennan was taken to urgent care. Tonight, as police investigate, administrators are assessing school policies to prevent another incident. After any kind of altercation, we always discuss, you know, things like, is there something else that we need to be doing in Oakville? Despite the tens of millions of dollars taxpayers are pouring into the Normandy school district, some schools are gripped by a climate of violence, frightening to many students and teachers alike. Tonight, a teacher explains how she was pepper sprayed during a student brawl. Investigator Elliot Davis exposes the troubling environment in tonight's You Paid For. Normandy school board members didn't want to talk to me about the violence at the North County District that lost accreditation. But Dawn Valdesi, a Normandy school teacher, is speaking out. She was attacked while trying to break up a fight during school involving a dozen ninth grade girls. One of the girls, she pulled out some dog repellent pepper spray, sprayed me in the face, in my hair, down my arms. And I went into a major asthma attack and they had to call the nurse over. Is administration doing enough to deal with the violence? I don't think they are. I think right now we're so worried about accreditation that that is the priority right now. A state education department grab shows the number of school incidents down dramatically statewide while there's a sharp increase in the Normandy School District. I obtained this record of incidents in the Normandy School District since last year. Just look at this. Page after page of trouble. Of the 182 incidents since last July, 24 fights, 21 incidents of bullying, one sexual assault, Three other sex-related infractions, two robberies, two loaded guns found on the parking lot, six assaults on staff. Are teachers fearful? Many of them are. Many of them won't talk. We had a teacher that was threatened to have, you know what, slapped out of her. An SSD teacher had threatened to have his neck snapped, and he sent that student to the office, and the student was back in his class within 15. Had a teacher that has been choked. Right now, Dawn is placed on administrative leave, accused of discussing a matter she thinks the district is just trying to shut her up. I've been very verbal about the violence at school. They get to school, you've got kids that are in tears in the morning, you've got kids that are hiding. Well, this teacher shocked those listening to her allegations here at the school board, including one episode involving two students, a fight, and a broken calculator. I had 
a student take a calculator and beat another student upside the head, broke the calculator, was not suspended. Math teacher Danita Martin's tales of school terror prompted gasps from this crowd. Another student got the scissors and started making a stabbing motion. When I went to administration, they said, well, he was already suspended earlier today. What am I supposed to do? Martin told members of the Shelby County School Board that student behavior at Grandview Heights Middle is at an all-time low. I'm called by my students, gay, lesbian, dyke, sir, and my favorite, white girl. She cited the ongoing verbal assaults as primary reasons for her pending resignation. Students tell me, who the F-bomb do you think you're speaking to? And shut the F up talking to me. But they go unpunished. When the teachers try to control them, they, they even outrage with the teachers. Parent Latrina Robinson came up to us during dismissal Wednesday to offer her account on the state of students here. They shouldn't have to come to school and be worried about being picked on and teased on and all that. And then they come up here and be like, like they just got it under control and they don't. They can't control these kids. She said she's moving her son out of the school as soon as possible, following the lead of at least one teacher. Way 31 created an investigative unit. We're calling it the I-Team. Over the past month, the I-Team looked into complaints about students assaulting teachers at a school in Huntsville. The interim superintendent calls it fake news. Well, Mr. Drake, we don't do fake news. And Way 31's Heather Mathis will prove that by showing you pictures of injuries and complaints filed by teachers who are concerned about what will happen next. Something bad is going to happen. It is a ticking time bomb in the school. For the first time since Way 31 broke the story, four teachers from Rolling Hills Elementary School in Huntsville are showing you the injuries they claim students caused in the classroom. It is a dangerous place to go to work. They stepped forward after interim superintendent Tom Drake tried to deny Way 31's discovery about students attacking teachers. Folks, there's been some fake news about Rolling Hills. It was really a slap in the face to say this was fake news. One of those teachers gave us these pictures of injuries suffered after they claim a student threw a chair at her. The injury sent her to an emergency clinic. I do not feel it's part of my job to um, to be assaulted every day. Another teacher showed us this picture of a bullet they claim they found outside of their classroom door. They find knives. They find bullets. These kids might be coming to school armed and ready to go. I'm scared. I don't know if you've seen elementary kids or not, but they're the cutest little thing there was. They'll come up and they'll hug your leg, but the eye might also kick you in the shin. And I want to make it clear that for the most part, I'm talking about accidents, not assaults. These are not accidents when a child comes up to you and hits you as hard as he can. It's not an accident when a child throws a chair at you. Way 31 wanted to know more, so we requested all of the injury reports from Rolling Hills Elementary School over the last two years. We uncovered 14 different reports of students injuring teachers. Four of them listed that they sought medical attention. One, because she claims a student hit her in the ear with a phone receiver, causing headaches and vomiting. Another shows a student flipped a desk, landing on the teacher's feet. I don't understand how that's an accident. You, they mean to hurt you. I think that maybe they feel ashamed of what's going on. They want to cover it up. Huntsville City Schools is under a federal desegregation order by the Department of Justice. It says the district punishes minority students unfairly compared to white children and listed a series of corrections. These teachers believe the district is turning a blind eye to their complaints because of the DOJ order. Nobody understands how bad it is. Like, come into the school, sit a full day, witness it firsthand, and you will see how much assistance and help we need. We dug through the Huntsville City Schools HR reports. They show since May 2014, 28 teachers have quit. Since our sit-down interview, two teachers we spoke with also resigned, saying they were scared for their safety. How many of these stories do you want of entire schools, entire school districts, where black violence in the classroom is wildly out of proportion? Entire schools are nothing but occasions of chaos, mayhem, and violence. And every single one of those occasions of chaos, mayhem, and violence is, is also provides us with more examples of denial, deceit, and delusion on the part of uh, the school, school boards and school administrators to try to pretend like something else is happening 
other than what really is happening. The teachers know what's happening. We spend a lot of time talking to teachers and don't make the black kids angry. Traumatized, that's the word. Even for teachers who are down with the cause, even for teachers who don't figure out, but just because they're down with the cause, the cause is not down with them. Even for teachers who know with every ounce of their being that no matter what else happens in that school, under no conditions can they make the black kids angry. Like every newspaper in the country, the San Francisco Chronicle about once a year poses a question that everybody in San Francisco just cannot figure out. So they write one of these really long articles to explain why they can't figure it out. The question is, why are so many more black people arrested than white people? Why are black people 10 times more likely to be arrested in San Francisco than a white person? Why? 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 So that's the question they ask. But they don't tell you this, but there's something really they inject into every word, every sentence, every paragraph, and through the whole article. They inject the answer. They inject an assumption that underlies the entire tone of the article. And that is, black people and white people commit the same amount of crime. Everybody knows that. Parentheses. And do you really have the guts to stand up in public to say black people commit more crime than white people? Because if you do, we will end your career in the public square, on parentheses. That's the underlying assumption of the article, one they don't have the nerve to even hint at. Of course, in a little light at the end of the tunnel, the, the art, in the comments, I saw when I got the article, there were like 30 comments in there, about 28 of them were of that ilk, which is, I know why there's more black people arrested, because they commit more crime. Of course, the, mag the article goes through all the other different things, like they're arresting almost 50% fewer people in California than they were just a couple years ago. Um, the stubborn rate, you know, they go to all the so quote unquote experts, and well, these, these darn rates between black people and white people are really stubborn. Hey, by the way, and this is something I've been saying for a long time. Remember, I lived out there for 35 years in the great state of California. When you live in Southern California, and by the way, I also, I also spent a lot of time with the immigration department. One of my buddies was one of the guys who ran the place. So I was down there a lot. So believe me, my eyes are open on what's happening at the border. Been there more than most anybody. But in Southern California, you, nobody sits around and talks about this Hispanic level of criminality so wildly out of proportion. Yes, people know people coming across the border, they're not all angels, 100%. But in this article, one thing it did interestingly show is that the racial disparity in people being arrested between white people and Hispanic people, well, it's not really much of a, there's not really much of a gap there. I think maybe for every one white person arrested, the rate for Hispanics is like 1.1 or something like that. The black rate in California, arrest rate is 10 times greater in the Bay Area. It's the exact same story that we see in every school district in America that we do here probably once a week. Some reporter picks up this study from the local school district or their local police department and they go, wow, black people are being arrested more often. I wonder what that's about. Then they go to the liberals, they go to the liberal police chief if they're there or anybody else and they go, yeah, we've got to do better. I mean, this paper ran a story not too long ago that we talked about, about traffic tickets in the San Francisco, uh, uh, San Francisco. When you have a failure to appear, I mean, that's, you know, if you get a speeding ticket, you pay it. If you don't, then there's, then they put a warrant out on you. 50% of the people with failures to appear in San Francisco are black. And when you take that to the, the county supervisors uh, of San Francisco and you say, what's up with that? They all, all they could say is, We've got to do better about the disparity because disparity is proof of white racism. Didn't you know that? Oh, yeah. If you want to throw a stink bomb into this article, if you want to throw a stink bomb into that San Francisco uh, examiner newsroom, 
All you have to do is mention one word. Asian. What are the Asians up to up there? The white girl bleed a lot and then don't make the black kids angry. We talk about an article that somehow slipped through the filter in, this, in that same paper where they talked about the dirty little secret of San Francisco. They did a study over a certain time period in San Francisco. They found out that 80, 80 85 percent of the, the strong arm and the robbery in San Francisco was black people attacking Asian people. We've got to do better, people. That's called San Francisco's dirty little secret. And even today, this whole thing of black on Asian violence is enormous in San Francisco, the area. We've done tons of stories on it in um, uh, in the Sacramento area. Okay, not exactly San Francisco, but pretty close. Tons of stories on Asian people, victims of black crime and violence, home invasions. What about the Asians? Are they attacking the black people? Are they attacking the white people? What's up with that? What about that disparity? Can we do better on that too? Or do we just have to keep playing this merry-go-round where every single year, every paper, every paper does the same damn story, same stupid story that doesn't ask the one, the one question, let alone answer it. Are black, you know, are black people committing more crime than white people? Why can't we even consider that? Why? Why can't we consider that when it's transparently true? One of the people they went to out and uh, to talk to about this article came from, um, we've seen them before. Does anybody remember a story we did about BART? One of the first BART stories we did is BART was having a lot of trouble on their trains. This is like four or five years ago. So one of the brainiacs at BART, probably doesn't work there anymore, said, hey, why don't we get an app? That way, when you're riding BART, you see somebody like, you know, doing acting up, threatening somebody, committing vandalism, robbing somebody, disturbing the other passengers, doing crazy unmentionable things on these on these uh, trains. When you see that, all you got to do is pull your app out and report it. Well, this group called the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, a bunch of liberals slash anarchists in the Bay Area, they worked with a newspaper up there to figure out that like something like 70, 80 percent of the complaints on the BART system were concerning black people. And black people only make up like five or 10 percent of uh, of the complaints of the riders in BART. Again, nobody wants to ask the question, well, were black people acting out, misbehaving, committing crimes more often than white people and Asian people on that train? No, no one's ask, No one wants to answer that question, even though they ask it and answer it at the same time in a, 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 a sub rosa fashion. The only answer is, of course, black people and white people commit the same amount of crime. That's why the, there's only reason, one reason for that disparity is white racism. They, that article made a huge splash up there. It made Bart withdraw the, withdraw the app. So now people just have to like grin it and bear it. Bart has an enormous amount of black violence. Got my favorite story over the last, um, well, my, one of my favorite stories over the last couple of years has been one of the stories we did out of BART. Remember 40 to 60 black people rampaged through a BART train station and a train beating the piss out of a bunch of white people? And we went on, the, you know, I got a lot of emails about that, including from people who were there, the cops who were there, or their families. And right away they said, yeah, that was a bunch of black people doing that. So I you know, wrote, hey, a bunch of black people rampaging through the San Francisco Bay Area. What else is new? Uh, but then, then there was a story. That, then, in the, in the, in that article, they went to Bart and they said, "Hey, can we see your uh, cameras? Because there's cameras everywhere." Well, it turns out, like more than half of the cameras that didn't work. Then a month later, on one of these Sunday morning talk shows, a board member of the board of directors of Bart just a city councilman, I think in Contra Costa, I think it's called. Uh, anyway, she's on the board of directors and, and she's talking to one of the, you know, one of these Sunday morning reporters. The reporter goes, hey, what's up with the uh, videos? Why can't we see the, why can't we see the videos? What's up with that crime? And the lady and the board member goes, yeah, I asked our, I asked our staff the same thing. The staff sent me a letter back and she, she reduced, she produced it and we produced it on video. 
The letter said, yeah, we have videos, but the reason we're not showing you the video is because we don't want to embarrass black people who are in the videos. Yeah, that's what she said. And the reporter and the board member just looking there going, what? 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 Yeah, that's what they said. And so, by hook or by crook, through one way or another, sometimes it slips out that black people are committing a whole bunch more crime than white people. This, of course, goes against the main, the dominant narrative of our age, the biggest lie of our generation, which is that black people are relentless victims of relentless white racism all the time, everywhere. That explains everything. And in San Francisco, the, the great world capital of Western liberalism, they're the, they're the uh, disparity is the greatest. Ten times more black people on a per capita basis get arrested than white people. How do you explain that? Wow. Okay, so all we can do now is just, I mean, just wait for the next story, exact story like this to appear in the next town, and the next town, the next town, the befuddled, befuddled reporter, the numbers that should overwhelm anyone's ability to deny them, the the ridiculous social workers going, yes, we have to give them more, you know, more free, more midnight basketball, which is what the people said here. Oh, yeah, I love this one. They said, no, we got to stop arresting people and start giving them community-based programs like restorative justice because that's what they do in schools, and it really works really well there. Good Lord, what a ridiculous thing to say. The schools where they use that are the worst schools out there. We just did that exact story the other day. I think it was out of South Carolina. They don't suspend or ex expel people. In, S in St. Louis, they lost like almost every teacher, kindergarten through second grade, because the school stopped suspending people and the students were so abusive, even that age, the teacher said, I can't take this anymore. Now it keeps happening in San Francisco. It's a Saint coast to coast and in between San Francisco, St. Louis, South Carolina, north, south, east, west, every point of the compass. Different parts of the country all united by one fundamental fact. Nobody wants to do anything to make the black kids angry. We've done more stories about the tsunami of black violence in black schools more than anybody else, period. But we've rarely seen a story full of more denial, deceit, and delusion than we're going to see uh, in this clip when we get to the story about why the fellas in this school up in Buffalo are attacking the teachers. So let's start in a city near Baltimore. Then let's run up to Detroit. Then let's, then let's go out to Buffalo to see why, well, why the white teachers are responsible when the black students attack them. This is the booking photo of Geronimo Harding Jr., who faces a felony first-degree assault charge in addition to others after police say he attacked his teacher at Lock Raven High School in Baltimore County. Police released new details about the violent encounter. This student was having a conversation with a teacher. Uh, the student got upset during that conversation. The teacher was sitting down in a chair, and the student began to punch the teacher in the face. He knocked him right out of the chair and onto the floor and continued to punch him. Other teachers had to come in, students even came in, and the uh, school resource officer had to respond, help break up that fight and restrain the student. WJZ obtained video of Harding being led away from the school minutes after the attack, which left the veteran teacher with visible bruises and stitches. Harding turned 18 just 11 days before the incident. That means he's now charged as an adult. Sources say he was in the ninth grade. Once we got a look at the injuries that the teacher sustained, they're quite serious injuries to his face. And so 
That caused us to go ahead and charge this student with a first degree assault. Court records show Harding was charged with being rogue and vagabond on his 18th birthday, a misdemeanor. Police declined to comment on any possible prior juvenile record. The teacher is recovering. We're told he did have to go to the hospital. Yeah, guys, that teacher is expected to recover. Sources tell me she's in stable condition. But what happened here at Cody High School is absolutely cringeworthy. A young man attacking a woman old enough to be his grandmother. This is the aftermath of a vicious attack on a substitute teacher at Cody High School. All of a sudden, all I hear is bang, bang, and I'm sitting there like, what happened? I was doing my work, and I just looked up, and she was on the floor, and she was like, shaking and stuff, like her head was messed up. Keontae Nelson says it all happened around 1030 Thursday morning in a math class. The student walked in and began punching the woman, sending her to the hospital. He ran up on the old lady, hit her, pushed her on the ground and hit her again. That's not something that anybody should do, especially not to the old lady. Brandon and Tisdale and two other students went after the boy as he ran out of the classroom. They were outraged he attacked the woman. My friend Keontae and my man's um John, we all like we felt offended by it because that's somebody's grandmother. So we ran out the classroom and the boys started running. We chased them down. Detroit Public Schools Community District says the student went after the teacher because she told administrators he brought drugs to school. There should never be an excuse to hit somebody. As students were being dismissed Thursday around 3.15, a 14-year-old freshman at McKinley High School, according to a teacher, was acting up in the hallway because his cell phone was taken away. The teacher, who asked that we not identify him by name or face, said he called the student's mother from his classroom phone as he had done the day before because of the student's bad behavior. While I was talking to the mother, she asked to speak to her son. He talked to his mother, mother very shortly and then handed me back the phone, started cussing at me, yelling at me. As I was going to sit back into my desk chair, uh, he uh, body slammed me to the ground and I'm not sure what I landed on, but my back was severely cut open. Teachers Union President Phil Ramore showed us a picture of the teacher's injury. How are you feeling? Not too good. Uh, very distraught. This is my career. This is what I love doing, uh, teaching students. And, and you know, it's, it's something that you never expect to happen in your career. Buffalo police arrested the student at the school. He's charged with felony assault and harassment, which is a violation. Remore says the student also told the teacher, Come to the block, we got guns. The teacher has been at McKinley for several years and has noticed a change. The culture of the school has drastically changed since Principal Barton was removed from the school. And the new culture of the school is, the culture of the school and new leadership of the school is, uh, is creating a culture where it's, uh, uh, teachers, teachers feel unsafe, students feel unsafe. This is one of the first schools that we have ever had that the teachers actually vote, took a vote of no confidence because of what was going on in that school. Ramore says the district has not done anything about the current principal in place, and he says something must change. Well, we've brought you a few reports over the past two weeks about discipline and behavior problems at McKinley High School. Now, a district parent group today says that we and others have portrayed the school unfairly, but it doesn't negate the fact that a freshman student was arrested for assaulting a teacher and neighbors living near the school. They are fed up. Two on your sides, Claudine Ewing is here to tell us what a parent group had to say this morning. Claudine. Scott and Mary Alice, a handful of members from the District Parent Coordinating Council held a press conference outside of McKinley High School today. They wanted to refute claims that the school has a disciplinary problem. Regarding the student body slamming, regarding that student who slammed a teacher, here's what the parent group had to say. The adult in the situation was the one who acted inappropriately. He provoked the student. He did not follow the district policy on how to do an intervention with a child. He did, did not use restorative practices. He didn't do anything that would have helped de-escalate the situation. Now, all last week, we reached out to the district and the principal of McKinley High School, but they could not discuss a personnel matter. The parents were also upset with images from neighbors that we received who have been fed up about the behavior of some of the students before and after school. We got to do better. 
We can't, uh, we can't continue to attack our boys and expect them to come up out of that and be peaceful and passive. We don't want our black boys being attacked. Uh, we want the progress to be talked about. And more importantly, and the most important, we want to work towards solutions for our kids. Isn't that what we say around here all the time? I mean, everybody, especially white people and white teachers, they have to walk this razor's edge of respect and disrespect. And when a black student threatens you or he doesn't want to obey the rules or the law, that just means that you are disrespecting him. Please, sir, I want some more. It's your fault because you did the one thing that in Buffalo or Detroit and in Baltimore, you just are not allowed to do forever, ever, ever, ever. You're just not allowed to make the black kids angry. The number of children and teens in the United States who visited emergency rooms for suicidal thoughts or suicide attempts doubled between 2007 and 2015, according to a new study. This is according to the U.S. Center of Disease Control and Prevention, blah, 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 blah. Suicide under the age of 13, one every five days. The numbers are very alarming. One every five days. Uh, it represents a larger percentage of all pediatri uh, pediatric emergency department visits where suicidal behavior among the pediatric uh, uh, population was 2% of all visits. It is now almost 4%. These are kids at 13 years old. Now, one reason, experts say, for the increase in depression and suicidal behavior is more stress and pressure on kids. Kids are feeling more pressure to achieve, more pressure in school. They're more worried about making a living than in previous years. Bull crap. Can't possibly be true. Bull crap. Bull crap. I mean, I, I guess, I mean... Look, I mean, I, there is some pressure, mm -hmm. right? But I mean, I, I feel like it's the reverse. Are you a doctor? I am not. A, are you, or you are a doctor. I am a doctor. That's doctor. true. I'm a doctor. Of, of humanities. Of humanities, which means I can diagnose all of humanity. That's so, not what that means. But. I'm pretty sure it does. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't ask any questions. I just took the certificate <laughs> and I walked out. So here's the thing. <laughs> let's, look, let's look at what right now, what it's like to be a kid. It's pretty sweet. In some ways, it's pretty oh, sweet. You should see the trampoline park near my house. It's freaking amazing. Yeah. If I had that thing when I was a kid, I would be happy all the time. Yeah, pretty sweet. But they're not playing outside anymore. They're not really connecting with nature. And nature is one thing. The ground roots you. There's something about having your hands in the soil and the dirt and the smell of grass and, and playing until you are just worn out. Being outside and being with your friends without any kind of parental supervision or any kind of structured game, just playing a game until it goes dark at night and you're like, I got to get home or my mom's going to be pissed. And the next morning you go out and your mom says, just come home before it's dark. Come home for dinner, right? Our kids are not doing that anymore. And our kids are spending a lot of time at home. They're exposed now to Hardcore pornography. Hardcore pornography. By the age of eight now. Now, this was something that if you were a teenage boy, you didn't really even get hardcore pornography. You didn't certainly yeah. didn't get videos of it. You might get the Playboy you might get that the... someone hides, you know, behind the garage Correct. type of situation. This is hardcore video. At the same time, there's no church, there's no faith, there's no community. In most cases, the community has completely broken down. At the same time, summer jobs. Now, the government is trying to make sure that kids don't get summer jobs. Or by internships. Making, or internships. Uh, because yeah, who's going to hire a kid at $15 an hour? I need somebody who I can truly depend on and has some skills because I'm going to have to let some of the skilled workers go to be able to afford the $15 an hour. Or I just shut down my part-time people and I just put all that extra work on the people who are earning salaries. Or make a kiosk. And then you don't have any people. There is trophies now for every kid. 
There is no sense of accomplishment. You're not first. You're not better than anybody else. You didn't accomplish anything. Everybody is a winner. Everybody is exactly the same. And you know what? You're really the same. Unless, unless you're white, you're a victim. You're a victim. You've been oppressed. And if you're a white kid, you've probably been oppressed by your white parents. You don't even know. You don't even know that you are being oppressed because you are the oppressor now. And everyone is a victim. And you can't do it. You can't make it because these guys are in the way. And you got to get rid of those guys. And we're the only ones that can help you now. You got to come through us. There's no meaning of life anymore. What does life mean? Their, their Planned Parenthood is in on first grade. Their, their hope is that within the first 18 months after a period... A girl gets pregnant. Their hope, their goal is to help that girl have three abortions by the time she's 30. That's their goal. If you're a boy, you're practically worthless. We haven't fixed the problem between the sexes. We have just reversed the problem. You were sexist against women. Okay, now we're sexist against men. You were racist against blacks. Okay, now we're racist against whites. It's the same problem, except we were making some progress. Slowly but surely, we were making progress, and now that's all gone out the window. You are so you are you are told that you that the world is so oppressive that if you were in a card store and you saw cards at the Hallmark store that said. You're the kind of boy that I'd make a sandwich for. That's what the card says. You would write and tweet, what the F is this? Jesus effing C. I, I was born in the 60s, and I remember this effing stuff in the 70s and 80s, and it's still here. Mother of God, I will kill. That, that was the tweet. What? That was the tweet. I will kill because this is oppressive. Let me let me play this. A girl saw uh, she's probably 18. Maybe she saw a Pepe the Frog cartoon, which is supposedly racist. I don't really care. I don't watch Pepe the Frog. I don't put Pepe the Frog. Who cares? It's a cartoon frog. But this cartoon frog had a clown wig on top of it. Somebody put a clown wig, a cartoon clown wig on a cartoon frog. This girl puts clown makeup on her face and this is what she records yesterday. You're not gonna take a symbol of happiness and acceptance and and multiculturalism and turn it into something racist and anti-Semitic and homophobic and transphobic. You're not gonna do that on my watch, you're not. So Pepe, he belongs to me now. Pepe the the frog with his curly ass Afro clown wig belongs to me. Stop. That is this woman. (laughs) This woman has a full fledged meltdown. She's a teenager. She has a meltdown over a cartoon frog in a cartoon clown wig. We're living in a Dr. Seuss world where men are women. Women are men and neither are either. There is no truth. There are no facts. There's only feelings. But even your feelings don't belong to you because you've been made to feel this way by someone else. We're having our kids play games where they're killing people online. They're demeaning each other online. There is no one-on-one interaction. Nobody calls each other. They text. They send pictures. There is no reality. Parents are hooked on social media and high-tech. And if they're in a house, and I don't care if this is left or right, the kids are hearing their parents respond to these tweets in ways that their mothers would never approve. But they're responding to these tweets, and they're angry themselves because they're watching the destruction of their country. There's not going to be anything left. And it doesn't matter which side you're on. That's what's being said in all of our homes. Now, let me ask you, you are a 13-year-old kid. You're just starting to 
grow into your own body. You're being told maybe you're not a girl, maybe you're not a boy. There is no, there is no consequence to anything. There is, there is nothing to achieve. You're never going to make it. You're oppressed. Why the hell do you think they're killing themselves? Why do you think they're depressed? It's really quite simple. And so is the solution. We are every label, occupation, race, physical characteristic, every label of honor. All of those things are temporary. Eternally, they're temporary. Don't label yourself. Don't let someone else label you or your kids. Don't put a limit on the goals that you can strive for. We're still Americans. I had forgotten what my father had taught me. My father taught me, as you think, so shall it be. What are our kids thinking right now? What were you thinking as a kid? I'm a good, spectacular kid. I'm a good kid. I'm a great kid. I'm, 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 I am in love with my family. I'm in love with my sister and my brothers. I'm a charitable kid. You're not thinking any of those things. You're fighting inside. I'm fat. I'm ugly. I've got a pimple. Nobody likes me. You're fighting that all the time. Help our kids. Start believing again in yourself. Start believing again in God. Start believing again, not in the country, not in the flag, not in our military, not in our banking system, but in our principles. Start believing in American principles again and God's principles. They're interchangeable. 